My name is Sharon Rackham King. Welcome to Arts Alive. The Arts Center in Corvallis, Oregon supports artists to offer this community outreach and I'm so excited to again be part of it. I'm also very grateful to the Mary Artist in McMinnville, a wonderful art supply store who donated many of the supplies that we'll be using today. And to American Easel in Salem, who donated the panels that we'll be painting on today. Let's go ahead and get started with our watercolor project. Well, let's explore these great materials that we have. So when you open up your kit, you will find a panel by American Easel. You will find a palette with a lid, and you can always just replace that lid when you're done. You will find some purple paint, some green paint, some orange paint, and a wonderful brush as well. A couple things that you will need that are not provided in the kit are just a small cup for water, some paper towels, and a pencil or pen. I'd suggest a pencil to start with, the lightest one you can. Two dimes if you want a little help with the drawing portion, and some extra water to have that is clean. You'll get a sheet of drawing guidelines as well, and so we will focus on the painting and let you use the paper for the drawing guidelines. My palette looks a little different than yours because I have primary colors in it of red, blue, and yellow in addition. And then I have pre-mixed this black color just for the center of the eyes using the purple and the orange and the green. So I have taken the liberty of already having the cat face drawn on here. And I call this particular lesson peek a -mew. I have a black cat that my family just adores, and he was the inspiration for this. His name is Nigel, by the way. Let's talk about the um, order of painting. The order is that you get your brush wet, and um, when you're painting just clear water, you take it directly to your panel or your paper. It'll work just the same with your really quality Arches watercolor paper that you have. I'm not sure if you can see the cat drawing um, because it's lighter on here. And my strong suggestion is that when you draw, you take um, your first drawing on just a regular piece of white plain paper that you have around the house. Feel comfortable with that. Move on to the watercolor paper that you have in your kit. And when you're feeling um, comfortable with that, you can put it on the panel. Our first step is going to be to paint in clear water. We are going to not paint the eye area. We're going to paint around the eye area. And the reason that we're painting in clear water is because we want to do some wet into wet painting. And that means that we have the surface wet before we put our wet paint on to it. If you see a little color, my brush probably had some color left in it from the last time I was painting. Also, I have edges that I did in black paint already so that it would show up on camera. You'll probably be using pencil instead of that. And that's why there's a little bit of what we call bleeding coming into the clear water from the edges. And that is totally fine for the purposes of this. But if you use pencil, you're not going to see much of the bleeding. I do suggest that you watch this video through before you start your painting, perhaps even before you start your drawing, so that you will have some of the tips that come early on in the process. Now, if I want to make sure that I have gotten all the areas wet and I can't quite tell, I lean my head over to the side and I look from a low angle to make sure. All right, so that is wet in all of the places I want it to be. 
again, not in any of the eyes. So I rinse my brush. Now your watercolor paint will go a long way, a very long way for just a small amount if you use it in the following fashion. One, to help preserve the, the brush, you have um, just lukewarm or room temp or cool water for it. Um, a hot water can undo the glue that holds this ferrule on to the brush. You use your brush gently in more kind of sideways strokes rather than straight up and down. So you just can lay it into the paint and the dry paint is regenerated right away. And um, you take it straight to the painting. The paint doesn't do any good when it's here in the water. So you take it straight to the painting. Oh, already wonderful things are happening. Look at that. We call these blooms or blossoms and I love them dearly. One of the things that is pretty unique to watercolor. No need to dip any of this paint back into this water. Resist that urge and just come right back to the painting. I tend to start in the ears to see how, how strong the paint is that happens to be on my brush. Looks like I'm getting a little bit of pooling on this side, so I'm going to move it down here. And I'm going to give myself just a little bit of cushion here, because perhaps my table is not level. Now it is time to rinse your brush. So this is the first time that we're needing to rinse it. And like I said, paint in the water doesn't do you any good and it just doesn't take very much paint to get something super, super vibrant. And now I just gently lay the brush across the paper towel to get most of the water out. The next step is called lifting. So to get kind of a, for example, pink, pinkish or, you know, pale or orangish um, effect in the ears, we're gonna take some of this color out. If your brush, if your brush <laughs> is drier, brush is a dry brush, um, than the surface that you're painting on, be it paper or a panel, then you can successfully lift paint. So your brush becomes an eraser. Rinse, drag it across the paper toweling, get down a little bit lower since there's that um, area on a cat's ears that tends to have less fur right underneath and I guess what you would call their temple there. Okay, all right, that's quite a difference. Okay, cool. Now, what we can do is move to <clears throat> the green phase. We end up with a black cat that I call Pikamu. And um, we get there in what seems like maybe an odd way, but hopefully you can trust me and go along with the process. Um, I don't, you know, I'm just picking up a real small amount of paint on my brush. I'm just touching, you know, this dry paint and I can see how much I'm getting by touching it to the palette here. And I'm not going to start in the ears because I don't want that to be the strongest area. I'm just going to wipe off this extra water from the ferrule in case it might want to drip. There we go. Start in the forehead here. The strongest application of paint is going to be at your first touches. So I'm going to then, so I don't just, you know, overkill the ears and have a lot of green um, bleed into the inner ear area. I'm going to avoid that inner ear area with the rest of the paint colors that we use today and let it be that um, kind of sweet peachy color. So using your little finger as an anchor is a pretty good tool, pretty good tool to help um, balance, guide you, stabilize your your hand as you go. So I'm touching something that is not the ear right at first, so that I'll get a little bit weaker paint. 
uh, into the ear so that it doesn't spread as far and appear quite as dark. All right, now um, it's important that this is done quickly enough that your surface is still wet. And so we just went straight from the orange right into the green, no hesitation, no, um, no taking a break. If, you know, your painting goes a little bit more slowly because you are newer at this or you have an interruption, <clears throat> pardon me, then you could always take a little spray bottle and spray it. Just make sure to cover the eye area or anything that you don't want to get wet. And notice I haven't yet needed to dip my brush into the water because it's been wet enough to continue to pick up the amount of pigment that I need. Partly that's because I'm working on a wet surface already. That orange paint is still wet. So when you dab like this, um, you are not disturbing the surface of the paint. When you use a brushing motion, for example, like this, then you could pick up some of the orange and move it away. See, I got a little bit into the eye. I'm not real worried. I want to make sure to touch up the edge so that it has enough. Okay, Is there, are we still wet over here? We are barely wet over here. So I think I do need just a little bit of water, but I didn't swish my brush around because I didn't want to lose the paint that was on it. Rest my, ed my edge of my hand on the table as another anchor. One thing that you do want to check fairly often is how's the edge of my hand is that clean because somehow it seems to attract paint at least for me it sure does so you're going for a fairly even look but see it's greener over here and more orange over here that's okay that probably means that the the light is coming uh more from this direction in and it's got a little bit lighter um appearance here all right so i'm going to rinse my brush now Still going to avoid painting the eyes. I'm still going to avoid painting the inner part of the ear. And as quickly as I can to make sure that this still stays wet, I grab some purple. Um, you know, if you have an orange cat or you like an orange cat and you want it to just stay orange, then, then you can stop there. Uh, you do have a couple pieces of paper, Professional Arches watercolor paper. Oh, it makes all the difference when you're painting to have a wonderful panel like this that has a water media surface, like this one made by American Easel right, right nearby in Salem, or to have professional paper. It, it makes a huge difference in your painting. And to have these nice supplies, like the professional paint that we have as well. That purple is extra dry, so I'm just gonna dip my brush in the water ever so gently. Uh, to regenerate the the wetness. We need pigment and we need water and that is why it is called water color. And so you won't see the effect of it being black right away, but as it dries, you um, it does change. And so you'll you'll see that as it dries. You know, your cat's eye color can be as you wish. It can be orange like the one in this example. It can be green. A lot of black cats, including Nigel, have green eyes. It could be that combination of green and orange, which um, when left alone can um, mix into a pretty nice brown. Um, or it could be black, and I have pre-mixed black on my palette in the center here. When you take um, these are secondary colors. The, the purple, orange, and green are secondary colors. If you did last year's watercolor tutorial with me, you got a palette that had the primary colors in it, the red, yellow, and blue, and we painted a poppy together. I wanted to try something different this year using secondary colors, which are thought of as the colors of nature, colors that also blend quite well together. Um, if you mix 
the secondary colors together, you get black. If you mix the primary colors together, you get black. Um, it, it, you know, some, some are a little bit more gray, some are a little bit more brown. It depends on the amount that you use. But essentially, when you continue to gather colors together in a mix, especially if they're opposites on the color wheel, and this is laid out in a color wheel, you will end up with a dark color such as black. Okay. I'm getting just dry enough. I'm just going to dip that in there without swishing it around so I don't lose the pigment. I want the pigment to stay in my palette so that I can do another project. Oh, I drifted into the eye. Well, you know what? Maybe that kitty has just a little extra twinkle in their eye. So I do a little bit of brushing so I can get things a little more even by the eye rather than the dabbing that I've been doing most of the time. Okay, all right. Now, if I have a little area that's uneven, I start out with the eyes just like a little bit bigger in the drawing than they need to be, just in case. Um, you need to close in on them a little bit to, to even things out and make each eye look fairly similar to its neighbor. Okay, I think I'm gonna add a smidge more purple up here where there's a decent amount of orange showing through. Or if there's you know quite a bit of green showing through, I'll do the same. Oh, you know, see, I started to lift some paint up because I must have been a little more brushing than dabbing. Now, what we're going to do is take a little break and let this dry. Voila, it's almost dry. I see a couple areas I want to touch up while we're waiting for it to fully dry. Let's, let's talk about that. So I see um, a couple little areas where the paint didn't quite come into the, um, to, to the line here of the ear. And I don't want to draw too much attention to that. That was just supposed to be a guideline. So I'm just taking a very, um, not very wet at all, quite damp um, brush to just touch a couple areas. And I see I'd like a little more color moved into this area. So I'm just gently pushing some color into an area that is lighter. And if you have a fuzzy cat, great! Many cats are fuzzy. If you want a fuzzy cat, just push at slightly random intervals some of the fur color a little bit out and you'll get this fuzzy effect which is kind of cool See how it's lighter? It's not quite as dark. I tend to not do it up around the ears because it seems like they have pretty smooth ears. Some of them have a smooth head, but some of them have a smidge of a, oh, shall we say mohawk, or shall we say just, you know, a little extra fuzz. A little extra fuzz, but as we get, you know, kind of into the ear area, I, I slow way down. And let's see, now I'm going to have to use some different dexterity instead of pushing because I am using my right hand. I'm on the right side, I'm going to pull. If you're uncomfortable pulling or pushing, you can always pick your, your panel up and turn it another direction so that you can pull or push the direction that feels comfortable to you. That is one thing that is fantastic about these palettes. They're great for taking outside to paint. Um, they're just super sturdy. You don't need to frame them. There's a lot of advantages to them. So there, if you <clears throat> had an area where your brush kind of slipped and you said, oh man, now I don't have a smooth cat. Well, you know what? Do that a bunch more times and then you'll have a fuzzy cat. No problem. You know what? I can push a bunch of fuzz up here into, into the ears. I can Take my brush and go over those ear whiskers 
anchoring it with my little finger again. Great. Hey, and while we're at it, it's a good time to draw out the whiskers. If you um, use your very slightly damp brush in just a straight line, it gives, it takes some paint away. It gives a little contrast there. So I'm gonna rinse my brush. Now my water's fairly clear still, so I'm not concerned about using totally fresh water. But if yours is looking kind of dark, you know, just bring in an extra cup and set this one to the side. So I just want it slightly damp. Um, so I'm, I'm lifting in one stroke and pulling that paint that I've just lifted onto the whisker that shows on the outside of the cat's face. Pretty clever, huh? These are things that I would practice on just a regular plain piece of paper, um, or if you have some student grade or inexpensive watercolor paper at home, you could practice these types of strokes. Well, let's move to the eye now that really the rest of the cat is sufficiently dry. And I think it looks more black than it looked in our earlier segment before we took a little break to let it dry. I am going to give this cat green eyes. And so, like I said, any color, any color you wish. Because it can be imaginary or it can be a cat that you've seen once that was super rare or it can be, you know, the cat that lives in your house or next door. I'm leaving these highlights open. So as you can see in this cat, it, it shows that a critter is alive when you have um, a, a gleam in their eye, a highlight. It shows that it's it's a living critter, and um, and it can also add some expression, and it can also tend to show the direction that that animal is looking. If you wanted it to be looking off to the side, you would move this green section over here. So you know what? I um, have made a mistake. And I'm going to, first of all, forgive myself, and second of all, correct it. <laughs> That's not where the color of the eye goes. Um, let's see how much we can lift off. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look how much we lifted off. And that's a pretty cool eye color too. So um, what I'm going to do is, when you make a mistake, you tend to, um, one, one way of fixing it is to double down. So I want to... Um, make it even. So I'm going to paint the pupil of that eye green too. Now I need a clean section of the paper towel. Look at that. Okay. So what I meant to do was to paint that area black. So what I'm going to do is to paint this area green and let it dry just a smidge. Well, let it dry all the way, but I'm not using super heavy paint. And um, then we'll paint the pupil black. In preparing for this lesson, I have painted, I, I don't even know, a couple dozen cats along these lines. And yet, you know what? I still can make a mistake like that. Um, so please, if you do, um, forgive yourself and then just, you know, find a way to move on. It also looks kind of cool to just have the, the green eyes. So, you know, don't fight it if it's working for you, even if it's not what is the official way of doing something. And if you haven't mixed a black in the center of your palette, then this would be the time to do that by just taking some green, some purple, and some orange and mixing it until you get a color that is dark enough and you know pleasing enough for you. Okay, I'm 
gonna get plenty of this on my brush. I'm gonna lay it flat. And as we're waiting for the green area of the eye to dry, I'll show you some options. Should you choose to have some paper collage along with this project, you know, you can um, cut it out around the size. You can use that template that you used earlier and cut out around it, glue it down. You can then take the interior of what you cut away and put it on something new. And you can, you know, give it more personality, give it a little color in the ears or make sure that those whiskers are really visible. If you did want to leave your cat orange, you could do that and you could um, add, you know, maybe a pale black or brown into some of these areas. I would consider this one unfinished as of yet. You could even outline the eyes for a little extra drama. And, you know, your backgrounds, you have so many choices with your backgrounds. You could start with your cat um, inside a border. This is an example of how it looks on paper after you've done the orange portion and then the green portion. Here, I haven't quite added enough orange to the process to make it an orange cat, but just another example of a border or background as well. And here's a little cutie that has a pattern in the background. And on some of these, you may notice I sign with my initials, especially on a small work, and you may choose to do the same. And you could do that with a colored pencil if you're an, or a pen if you're not feeling as comfortable with um, painting something so finite as a signature quite at this stage. I do believe from looking from a side angle that the green outer area of the eye <clears throat> is dry. So I have a good amount of heavy black and that means not too much water on my brush and a pretty good load of pigment. You know, and nothing would be wrong with leaving the eyes the way that they were without this, but I'm gonna go for a little drama. Um, this black, or if you do something that a lot of watercolorists don't recommend, which is use black out of a tube, it just is a little, it, it, can, it can appear a little lifeless. Um, I want quite a, a dark black for this section, and I want um, a, a fuzzier, less defined, black for the main body for the fur so that it looks a little more textural and it, and it looks like fur and um and i'm just doing this nice and slow and just with the very tip of the brush so that it's you know it's a pretty finite operation here when you mix your black instead of using it from a tube it it has a lot more life it has a lot more energy and interest and you know little flecks of orange show through little flecks of purple show through you can see green now and again and so that makes it more lively and it entertains the viewer and that's what we are going for is to entertain the viewer one of the things that was hard for me at first well still is really truth be told is to realize that the viewer wants something to look at and be entertained by from across the room. And the viewer wants something to look at and be entertained by up close. So perhaps across the room, you'll see these eyes. They're pretty dramatic. You'll see the outline of the cat against the white background. You may not see from across the room the, the whisker details, right? But when you come up close, you will. And so it's always nice to have an impact from across the room and a surprise when you come up close. Now, I'm going to do some adding and some lifting. So there were these kind of you know, eyelash type areas. Again, check the side of the hand before I lay it down on my surface. 
And thanks again to the Mary Artist in McMinnville, a just wonderful supply store uh, for art supplies. Locally owned, staffed by artists. They know what they're doing. They have super quick shipping. Um, family owned, just really, you know, pretty fantastic. Ah, okay. I added black there and that makes the cat look kind of serious. So I'm going to see if I can lift. Oh, that lifted pretty darn well. Look what it also did. It lifted some out of the eye. So I'm going to dab that back in because it was wet. And I didn't use the paper towel in a real finite fashion. Um, I'm going to kind of see what it looks like to add black to the nose lines. And I have my hand anchored at the wrist on the table here. I think... I think that is good in this circumstance. I'm going to rinse my brush and then do a smidge more lifting. So for this eyebrow area, maybe, you know, maybe you want a serious cat. In, in the drawing area, I discussed um, if, the, if the eyes come in toward the nose at an angle going down, the cat might look upset or it might look serious. Um, if it comes the opposite direction, it might look worried. If, if it's really, really round, it might look surprised or it might look innocent. Like what is um, in Shrek, Puss, Puss in Boots um, has the biggest, most innocent looking eyes. If you're going for that kind of an effect, um, you can make them very round and very big and make the um, pupils extra big. Ooh, I dropped water right here. I'm going to leave it if I touch it, um, it will lift up the paint. So I don't want to touch it with my hand. I don't want to touch it with the, um, the brush or a paper towel. But I'm just going to try to lift in here without touching the um, pupil of the eye this time. Okay, so this is one of those up close surprises, not one of those impact from across the room areas, these little eyebrows, if you will. I'm not sure we've ever thought of cats as, as having eyebrows, but for the purposes of today, let's, let's go with it. Okay. All right. I am pretty pleased with this. I am going to put my initials. I could do it here or I could do it right here within the whiskers. That might be fun. I'm curious to see how your PKMU turned out. If you'd like to contact me, please, I would love to hear from you. I ended up with the background on mine being just some simple orange dots and green eyes. There are so many different choices though. You could even have a different color of fur if you'd like, or eyes. A couple background choices there. A little more traditional kitties here. In addition to the background, you may wish to add to your painting an edge treatment, such as acrylic painted on the edge. It could be a metallic paint, could be watercolor, stain, a combination of a solid color and a metallic or you could just leave it the beautiful natural wood that it is when you first get it. When you do get your American Easel panel, before you start painting, you can take this plastic off and wipe, make sure there's no more construction dust on it. And the panels don't just come in these sizes, they come in huge sizes like the ones behind me from American Easel in Salem. We'd like to thank them and we'd also like to thank the Mary Artist in McMinnville, an art supply store that has a fantastic selection and they've donated so many of the materials that we've been working with today. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Art Center in Corvallis, Oregon. They support artists and they support our community by making sure that programs such as this get out toward the folks who live here so that you all can enjoy it. Art has been a balm to my soul. I very much hope that you've enjoyed this project and that you have paint left over and you can keep experimenting and keep working with it. 
I hope it's brought a little enjoyment to your day. Thank you for your participation in Arts Alive and continue to enjoy the summer.